Well, on Monday, we started talking about the issue of humility as the next area of challenge that uh, James sets before us. And he really wants to emphasize how important and vital it is really uh, to our happiness and success in living effectively as a Christian in this world. How important it is that we walk not in pride, but we're in humility. And uh, yesterday we focused on defining and trying to understand what pride is, that God opposes the proud. and I. And I hope that uh, you had an opportunity yesterday just to really spend some time thinking about how does pride manifest itself in my life? Because it does. Uh, and unfortunately, it does it in a way that we don't readily recognize because as I said before, uh, pride comes so naturally and it feels so good to be proud that oftentimes it, it just goes right under our radar. And we really need to ask the Holy Spirit to heighten our awareness of the ways in which uh, our pride expresses itself. And I'm not saying that there's that's an enjoyable thing to go through because for me personally, it was very, very painful because I began to see how it really eked out and still does in so many ways that had become habitual in my life. And, uh, you know, basically the only way you can deal with that is to humble yourself and admit it and then confess to God, God, that's pride, isn't it? That's arrogance, that I'm, I'm looking with disdain or haughtiness or contemptuousness on somebody else and, and, and forgive me for that, Lord. I, I know that's sin in my life. That's the only way you can deal with, um, with pride. I mean, you can't just simply say, well, from now on, I'm gonna be humble. I, all I'll say to you is good luck with that because humility is a grace that God gives us. It's not something that's natural or characteristic of who we are. And that's why he says that, again, as we talked about yesterday, that he opposes those who are proud, which is the best reason in the world not to uh, give place to pride in your life, uh, because you'll just find yourself running into dead ends. But rather, he says he gives grace to the humble. What does it mean to be humble? Well, first of all, uh, again, in the lexicons, they say it means first to be unpretentious. Uh, and unpretentiousness means that we're not attempting to impress others with an appearance that we're more important or more talented or more cultured or uh, more successful than they are. <clears throat> in fact, even if you're the most successful person in the world, you're probably still gonna be guilty of exaggerating how uh, successful you are. And basically what that reveals is that there's this inner need in all of us to try to feel like we're uh, of worth and of value, but somehow we don't know how to see ourselves worthy and valuable just like everybody else, simply because when God says he created us in his image and when Christ tells us he loves us, um, that should be enough. That should be enough to make me feel good about myself. And yet many of us want to have something that not only makes us feel good about ourselves, but feel a little bit better than everybody else, that we're kind of that exceptional being. And I just think about how even one Christian uh, counselor many years was saying, you need to help your kids to become special at something so that they have a high self-esteem. Um, and I'm not opposed to, to people feeling good about themselves. I think that that's a wonderful state of being. But why do I feel good about myself? Do I feel good about myself because I know that God loves me and he has a great plan for my life? And, I, and, and I, in spite of my incredible unworthiness, he has shown me such grace and kindness? Or do I simply think, I'm just that much better than everybody else. I'm just that good. And that kind of high self-esteem is the, is the world's wisdom, but it isn't the way of the cross. And many of us have a hard time working through that because on one hand, we beat ourselves up all the time. I mean, uh, I think the psychologist Brene Brown has written many books on the issue of shame and how that shame is kind of the emotional state of being du jour in our culture today. And uh, a whole lot of reasons that I don't have time to get into. But most of us feel so much shame, but what we don't understand is that the way we get to that shame is really being angry because we're not better than what we are. And we don't wanna take responsibility for sinful things that we have done. The secret of getting rid of shame is simply by confessing it as sin and recognizing that it's an expression of a fallen nature and that the only answer to get rid of shame is to basically confess the sin and ask God to forgive me and then believing and accepting that forgiveness. What too many people try to do is get rid of shame by pretending that their sin isn't sin. 
Uh, you see, guilt is something that is a forensic reality. It's not an emotion. It's just a fact that if I sin against God, I, I feel guilty. And so it's important for us that we understand that God's desire is to give us grace and to give us more and more grace. But if we don't under, a, a, acknowledge that we need that grace, we desperately need it, then and, and that we have no other way of being effective, victorious, holy, healthy, uh, mentally, socially, physically, unless he shows us his grace, then we're, we're trapped in, in a state of frustration, of, of pretentiousness. Pretentiousness, get the connection with the word pretend, we're pretending to be something we're not better than what we are. The second thing that um, humility is, is it's reverent. Uh, basically, it has a deep and solemn respect, not for myself, beyond the fact that I have been fearfully and wonderfully made, that I am a creation of God and I am the temple of God. But there's a sacredness about us that comes from his indwelling presence in our life. That there's a, there's a majesty and a beauty and a nobility in every human being simply because they bear the image of their creator. But at the same time, uh, I humbly need to recognize that it is God who has created me and it is God who has empowered and enabled me and, and has chosen, has, has humbled himself, if you will, to come into my life and use my body as a temple for his presence. It's interesting in Zechariah 9 where it talks about, uh, a prophecy talks about the coming of Messiah, which was fulfilled at Jesus' triumphal entry. You can read about that in Matthew chapter 21. But what, is, what Zechariah prophet said, Behold, Israel, he's saying to them, Your king comes to you humbly, meek and lowly. In other words, one of the most defining characteristics that we find there and also in places like Isaiah 53 is that Christ walked in humility. So he who had the power of the universe at his fingertips, who could call ten, you know, 10 legions of angels and destroyed his enemies, if not the entire world in a moment, is the one who also walked humbly with us. He humbled himself, get ready for it, he humbled himself by becoming just like you and me. And if he had to humble himself to become just like you and me, then we need to understand that we really are just, you know, we're in one sense, we're just flesh, we're just meat. But the reality is that God has indwelt us and filled us with his holy presence, making us of insurmountable value to him. We are a container. I, I was given a, a really nice watch uh, not too long ago, and it came in this beautiful, beautiful wooden box. And, uh, and everything about it was luxury. So in fact, the box was so nice, I have kept the box now for about five years because <laughs> it's, it's really a pretty box. Uh, but it held within it a beautiful watch. And I, I really appreciate both the box and the watch. Uh, what is my body? Well, it's an amazing box, but what's inside is really what matters. It's the really thing that becomes utilitarian, and that is for us. This box may be a great thing, but inside of us is the Spirit of God living and reigning, and that's the utilitarian, the useful, the blessed part. The last thing that he said that the definers say about the word uh, humble is that it's unobtrusive. In other words, it doesn't seek to attract attention to itself. For some of us, this is really hard. I mean, we're so craving the approval of other people that we act out all the time in ways that draw attention to ourselves. And um, I'm as guilty as anybody. And I'm just saying that when we're walking in humility, we, we kind of lose sight of that need. There's such a peace and contentment that it no longer matters whether we're recognized or not or applauded or not. Uh, we don't drop names and we don't uh, want our name to be dropped. We just want to go invisibly through this world. And I think that's really, I think in terms of us serving God, I, th I often tell my, my ministry team that this is really the way I want us to, to function. I want us just to move under the radar, not seeking to promote or lift ourselves up and draw attention to us, but just the opposite. And I'll be honest, I get emails from all sorts of Christian organizations that want to get our name out there. And I'm just not interested because if God wants to publicize someone, he can do it all on his own. He doesn't need me to help out. Anyway, these are going along because obviously I've wrestled with the issue of humility and pride 
gr a great deal over the years. So I have a lot of thoughts. Uh, again, we'll pick us up as we continue tomorrow. Thank you for hanging with me today. In Jesus' name, amen.